I don't have a microphone, so I'm just going to shout really loud. What? Yes. <laughs> uh, my name's Alan. This is the uh, Puget Sound Programming Python, or Puppy, meetup. Uh, thank you for coming. A lot of you look familiar. How many people are your first time? Oh, that's good. That's good enough. Welcome. Welcome to the meetup. We do these once a month. Second Wednesday of every month is our goal. We've been pretty good about that, except for like once. And then we have a programming night every Thursday, including tomorrow. You just show up and you write code and socialize. And if you need mentorship, there's people there to help you. If you uh, are there to uh, just learn new stuff or just socialize and meet people with like <coughs> interests, show on up. It's uh, the Starbucks on Summit and Olive on Capitol Hill. That's every Thursday. Uh, it's been pretty popular. About 20 or 30 people show up. <coughs> Uh, and then we've been trying to do a monthly happy hour. Uh, we did that with great success last week. We tend to do it the first Wednesday of every month. That's run by Nick Denny, who is not here, I don't think. It's co birthday. For shame, for shame. <laughs> he showed up yesterday, so I guess he's okay. Uh, so he does our happy hour. It's typically in Pioneer Square, but we're thinking about moving around. If there's a neighborhood you prefer, contact someone. Uh, and then we just show up, we typically do it at uh, J&M or Pioneer Square Saloon. About 20 or 30 people show up to that. Um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce the sponsor of tonight. First sponsor is obviously Rover. We're in their offices. Thank you very much, Rover. This is Phil. He's the co-founder of Rover. He's got a little something to say. Speak loudly. All right. Uh, also, no microphone, so I'll just yell. Um, yeah, welcome to Rover. Uh, we are a dog sitting marketplace. We are a Python shop. Um, almost everything we do is in Python. Our um, including our infrastructure stack, we use Salt, which was recommended actually by uh, somebody from another Python meetup group a few years ago. Um, long story short, if you like dogs and like Python, we're hiring. So. <laughs> Great. Uh, our other sponsor, Arian, yeah. with OfferUp. He's also a co-founder, I believe, of that company. Yeah. That sounds very similar because we're a Python shop and we run on Django. You guys have dogs, though. <laughs> we have a few dogs and now and then, but it's occasional. <laughs> but we have lots of items. We are uh, a marketplace, but it's uh, mostly about uh, used items. Um, I just curious who has used OfferUp in this room, outside of people working in so, uh, We're in the east side. So we're actually kind of proud of last. Uh, yesterday we were able to do the same event on the east side. I'd love to get more of these events on the east side. So my second question is to figure out like all the people here, who's in, who lives on the east side. How many people work on the east side? How many would you? Sh how many would show up to an event on the east side? It's a good amount. Okay. Right. Yeah. Great. Well, there we go. Yeah, that's good to know. Just so living on the east side count for the traffic. <laughs> well, serious. It counts also. It's easier for me to do pipe meetups here than where I live. Oh. Okay. It's uh yeah well the the thing is we we we've been really um, lucky I guess to to be where we are right now. We're five years old. Um, slow start, really growing fast, and what has helped us to do now is actually have the space on the east side where we can host events. So glad to host this event, but if you have other events that you do and you want to explore the east side with your meetup, uh, let us know. And Sandy is out there, Bill is over there, so we can help with meetups. Thank you. So uh, first off, what we're going to do is a quick lightning talk. Our meetups, we normally do a couple lightning talks and then a few bigger talks. We don't have a lot of time today because our second talk is really long, but also like really cool. So less lightning talks. Uh, first and only lightning talk, Chris Taylor. Is that right? All right, come on up. He's going to talk about using Python as an educational tool. I'll let him do the rest. Speak loudly. All right, guys, I'm Chris. This is my first time here, so say hi afterward. Uh, so I was recommended here by the founder of an organization I volunteer at. I volunteer at Se uh, Seattle Coder Dojo. We uh, are out of the Wainwright building off of Mercer Street every Saturday. We teach kids 5 to 18 programming for free, right? So when I went there, we were offering code.org, Scratch, and JavaScript, and the JavaScript room was really full because it was a highest-end room. And we had a lot of kids who wanted to learn a lot of different stuff, but we only have so many people, so much space, right? So I started a, uh, a general computer science room there teaching Python. My youngest in the room is seven, and my oldest is 13. 
and I found Python to be a really good teaching tool. We just wrapped up a module teaching them a, a command line implementation of war, right, card game, because it's really easy to program, right? You can set the whole thing up in a couple of loops, but it really let them focus on when you're teaching them object-oriented stuff, right? A bunch of these kids are probably gonna grow up to be our bosses in like 20 years. <laughs> really, really mind-blowing, right? But, I mean, we used to teach JavaScript, and we had a lot of pro we had a lot of problems in the JavaScript room, right? Because JavaScript, like a lot of languages that aren't Python, is very ugly and syntactically dense, right? We'd have a lot of problems with kids who wrote code that wasn't working because they couldn't follow their code because readability is not a factor when you have a language that's not delimited by white space like Python. So you just have all these lines everywhere and this thing over here and this thing over here, and they're like, and they're young kids, so a lot of it looks like that, right? And no one knows why it works, and you look at it and your eyes just like puke onto their keyboard, and then you own a laptop, right? So when I started using the Python room, it worked out really well, right? Because like I said, Python, there's very little syntax to trip over. So, I mean, I'm not gonna tell you guys anything you don't know, you're Python professionals, right? But if you have a young kid, I highly recommend using Python as a teaching language for them. Because it supports so many different programming paradigms. You have imperative, functional, object-oriented, reflective, some others I'm probably forgetting about because I only use Python when I can. But, so you can teach them a lot. We, they can learn pretty much anything they want to, right? Kids want to make a video game. Import Pi game. There we go, right? There's like three months of development time that I don't have to teach them, and we can focus on all the cool stuff that they want to do. Uh, we can make little uh, desktop applications using Kivi, right? So the syntax is a dense. We can teach them almost anything they want to. It's my first time giving a talk, and I forgot a couple more points, so I'm open this piece of paper really quick. Uh, all right. So it does force them to keep their code clean, which is fantastic, because I'm actually capable of helping them out. And it works out really nice, because we use a lot of collaborative tools. We use uh, Lucid Charts, because I like to be a little taskmaster. So I'm, all my kids in there doing UML diagrams. I want to see an unhappy five-year-old be like, is that, what is that? What type of variable is that supposed to be? Right? They don't, they don't like that. But it, it's really helpful. And they're like, oh, man, I have this thing I can look at that I thought was really boring. So we use Lucid Charts, we use CodeShare.io. It's like, a, if you've never used it, it's like a little Google Docs for uh, coding, right? So they all get to collaborate in the same file, which is great because it tracks their indentation separately per user on the page. So just a million indentation errors and we put it in there. You know, a little sublime text and that's good to go, right? We don't have to, I think the biggest thing I like there is that I can really teach them Anything that they want to know, they pick the topics, right? Like, unfortunately, they uh, asked for something they didn't know what they were asking for, so I'm doing it 10 weeks where I'm teaching them uh, writing command line chess, which is uh, a much bigger problem than I thought it was, something that I have never done. <laughs> I probably should have said I need like three weeks to get that ready, so I gotta write this whole thing in two days. But they can do stuff like that, right? If you think about doing, I don't know if any of you guys do anything other than Python, but think about doing something like that in like a C Sharp or a Java, and just how much has to go into your class design, like how do I encapsulate this field, how does this interface with what, right? And like, sometimes it can be an off. Python doesn't really have privacy, and in this case, that's really great, because I'm not, I'm not teaching at Stanford, right? We're volunteering, and we, they want to learn I want to teach them stuff like inheritance, and they want to learn. They want, they want to learn a little bit about text parsing because some of them are a couple weird, a little weird, and that was a request I had. So we'll learn a little bit of regular expressions, right? A little bit of graph theory. I hope they want to know what vertices are. But there's just so much that Python doesn't need, and so much that you can do with it. It's really been a great thing. And if any of you guys are ever free on Saturdays, come on by, man. These kids are these kids will really surprise you. They really try it. They really test you out, man. Last week, I had a kid ask me. I had three different kids. I had to help somebody with Postgre calls. I had to teach somebody how to implement a black white tree. And I had to teach somebody entirely about generators because they are pulling NASA star data into a JavaScript rendering of the universe. <laughs> so if you ever, if you ever want to see, and you wonder, you wonder why it took a long time to load, right? And I'm like, you're pulling this whole thing, right? It's, <laughs> but yeah, it. If you want to try something cool and you want to be challenged and you want to flex your Python skills, or have 10 weeks coming up on that, be a cool thing to do. Uh, questions? Yeah, questions, because five minutes is a long time to fill when it's a really nebulous topic to talk about. <laughs> yes? Uh, what um, hours on Saturday? Uh, 10 to 12. Cool. We've been every other week through the summer, <laughs> but starting this Saturday, we are every week again. Uh, I think we're on Eventbrite, right? 
Any other questions? questions? If I want to, if I want to volunteer to just find you, and you can help point me in the right direction. Yeah, yeah I'll just give you my business card and I'll email out the link. Uh, if yes. Um, but do you guys need any like other areas of help or support? Yeah. So we have hardware maintenance. Uh, a lot of a lot of Linux laptops, Dells that are big and heavy. Um, we're also looking for a hardware <coughs> sponsor because right now. Because it is kids, and a lot of them are using their parents' work machines. I'm very limited in what I can do, which is why it's command line chess and harder than it should be because I can't use something just like Tekinter or Kivi, right? It's because we're doing all of our development in a Cloud9 because a lot of kids can't install stuff because they're in their parents' work machines. So I'm trying to get some laptops together, and then we can teach them stuff like Pygame, Kivi, stuff they'll actually use. We can teach them. Some kid asked me about Django the other day, and I'm like, you don't want to learn that right now, man. <laughs> <laughs> Too young for that. I've seen some shit, brother. <laughs> but yeah, if any of you guys want to help out, or you know anybody who can help with hardware, or you just generally want to know more, if you have, like, oh, if you have any kids coming up, you know anybody with kids who want to learn programming, I strongly, strongly recommend Python for a lot of reasons. Do all the basic stuff, and it's a language that's in scale with you, probably all the way up until you're ready to start looking at something like a career in Java or C++, and you can do it all about like privacy and all that good stuff. Cool. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Next up is a pretty cool talk on a new API called Hug. Yeah, all right, cool. I, I can read, I swear. Uh, by Tim Crosley. He just created a new web API for building, it's for building like RESTful APIs, if I'm correct. Yep. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Your whole talk will correct me. What am I thinking? Uh, yeah, so Tim Crosley is going to talk. He works at Domain Tools as a developer. I don't know what his job title is. I should have done my research. Uh, but yeah, this is going to be a really cool talk. This is, I believe, his first talk on the API. You just released it open source a few weeks ago. Yeah, about. Three weeks ago. About three weeks ago. I'm sure it's going to be in his slides. I apologize for being redundant. So, yeah, without any further ado, Tim Crosley, please speak up and turn your thing on. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So, yeah, I'm going to be speaking on Hug. It is a Python framework for building APIs. It does not, it does not stand for human usability guidelines in this case. Um, and that is not a drop bear. It's a friendly, cuddly koala. So why did I create a new framework? Um, I'm sure everybody has seen this XKCD. There's a bunch of them out there. And obviously, the solution is to create another one. Um, The reason I created it is because I really feel like no matter how many good ideas you have, they don't matter if you don't implement them. And I've, I've seen a lot of programmers that have awesome ideas for APIs, for tools, for ways to back up data, and they just get home after a busy day of work, and it takes forever. You have to do a lot of things that should have already been done for you. Um, and I am in sort of the same situation. And in all these cases, when they explain the problems to me, they're very simple to explain. They're sim very simple to create a spec for them. But actually creating them is way more difficult than it should be, considering how long we've been um, as programmers creating APIs. Right? It shouldn't take a while when you get home to create a simple thing. So in my opinion, we are still at too low a level of abstraction. And I know a lot of people are sort of anti-abstraction. They think, oh, if you're you're closer to the hardware, or you're, you write stuff um, as low level as you can, you'll have better performance, and it'll make up because you can scale in the future and all this stuff. But I, I simply do not believe that's true. I think you should be able to write stuff like English, and it should work. And I think that's what Python as a language does. So to me, every web framework that's out there right now looks and smells like an onion. So what I mean by that is it has lots and lots of layers. Um, I could use cake as an analogy, but that's too awesome. Um, so I think that in the frameworks right now, independent of which one it is, you still have to do these things. You have to create sort of a Python API separate from your web framework code. 
that defines what you want to do. Let's say you want to create something to add two numbers. You'd create a sum method. It would take number one and number two, um, and then you'd expose it. So then you would start thinking about how to take those arguments in, how to validate them, make sure they're integers. Um, and then when you returned it, you would say, well, what do my clients want to read it in? So maybe they want to read it in JSON. Maybe they want to read it in, God forbid, SOAP, or whatever it is, you'd have to transform the data and send it off to them. And that's a lot of work if you're just doing something simple. Also, most Python web frameworks are unsurprisingly very slow. Um, so you can see these are benchmarks that were done by a third party. And how many requests on average each framework can take. And you can see like Django and Flask are very slow on how many requests they can take. This isn't that big of a problem, in my opinion, because most likely your Python code itself is going to be the barrier. But it's still something to think about. And it's interesting that something that has such a high level of abstraction, um, as I'm about to show you, is way faster than other frameworks that are a much lower level of abstraction. And in my opinion, we're already creating the APIs. Before we choose to expose it under HTTP or as a command line interface, when we create a Python method, we're already solving this problem. We're already saying, what arguments are required? What arguments are optional? Um, what type do I want for them? We're already doing that. So why should we have to do it again just because we want to export it to somebody else? So this is what, in practice, the most basic hug API looks like. And now I'm going to run it. It self-documents how the usage of the API, and there's it being hit. So it literally was just adding a decorator to an existing Python function. The core building blocks of Hug are method decorators, like you just saw, <coughs> type annotations, which are a Python 3 only feature that lets you describe what Python type each argument you're um, accepting takes. Input formats and output formats, both of those default to JSON. And for you provides automatic documentation and automatic version handling, which means in the future, if you need to create another version of your API, you can just specify the version on each individual function in your decorator, and it will automatically route to them, um, depending on version headers or URL, and automatically document them for your users in your automatically generated documentation. So the first thing I'm going to do with Hug, um, sort of demonstrate its usage, is build a to-do list that's available anywhere. So this is our spec. Like if I was talking to my friend, what it would be. Um, it's a list of tasks. They're persistent. Users can add to the list. They can remove from the list. And they can view the list. And they can view it from a web API if they want to. They'll need to be authenticated. And they can do it from the command line. So here would be a fairly simple Python API to do it. Um, and then this is the same API with the hug decorators to expose it. And already you can use this API with just that. But the problem is just that the, the list wouldn't be persistent. So to make it persistent, we're going to use hot Redis. And now it is stored on Redis as a persistent list. And then to authenticate a user in Hug, you just create, in this case, we're creating basic authentication. You just create your authentication method. And you say, for each one of your decorators, it requires it. Hug also lets you um, create CLIs from your existing functions. Because if you think about it, a CLI is just like an API where you define what arguments are required, what arguments are necessary types, all that, it's the same thing. Why do you have to define it twice? Um, and all this, like your doc string there, be ends up being the documentation for your command line interface. And so this will be the interface that our to-do list uses from the CLI. And this is the entire remotely available to-do list. Um, I think it is 32 lines of code. Hopefully, everybody can see it. 
<laughs> um, and I'll go ahead and I can finish this to-do item now that I'm already doing the presentation, I believe. And you can see um, right here is the server that was generated from that code. I put it up on Heroku, and it automatically generated JSON documentation for the API and all of its usage from a little bit of code. I think the documentation generated is probably more lines than the actual Python code to create the API. <laughs> And you can pip install this if you want to try it out. All right, for the next thing we're going to do with Hug, implementing our own CI server. I'm not sure if anybody of you guys have used Travis. A few people, maybe. Um, a lot of people see it as like a black box, or something super complicated. You would never implement it yourself. It's this big company that has probably invested way too much time in creating it. Um, it is complicated. And a lot of it should be, but we're going to try to create our own. <coughs> so the first thing we're going to do is just draw a pin, like the little badges you see that say success or failure with Pello, um, which is the Python image library. And so we take a text, a background color, and a font color, and we draw the image to the left. And then to the right, we take any value, a Python value, and convert that into a image. So basically, if our function says it failed, it will be false. And if it says it's true, it will pass. Then we have code to grab repositories from GitHub, clone them locally into a temporary directory. And that's what this does. And then we'll need a background worker to do our continuous integration checking for us. And in this case, because Python has talks, it'll automatically um, use that. And that will mean that it will be in a virtual environment for us, so we don't have to worry about any, anything too complex. And then it will store that result in Redis, letting it know that the build succeeded and what the result is. And then the interesting part for this talk, we expose that via hug, and it's just this. We have a hug.git method, which will return a status image, which is the badge, the one you see on GitHub for Travis. Um, and all that does is return whether or not the build succeeded. And then you can see it uses function annotation to transform that into a pin, um, which is the little badge you see. And that calls that method I showed earlier. And then it also has a function that is exposed to let you see the current results of the build. Altogether, it is under 100 lines of code. And you can see it is also on GitHub. And you can actually see the, the badge here in action. Um, and here is the entire continuous integration server we've created with the worker, the build status API, and the build text API. And just to show you what it would look like if it failed, here's this. And then because our API shows us or stores the results of our build automatically, um, we can click on it. And it will show us why the build failed. So all that with about 100 lines of Python. All right, and that's pretty
pretty much it for my presentation. Um, <clears throat> if anybody has any questions. Yes? With the uh, documentation, consider using something like Swagger, where you could automatically generate SDKs. Like yeah, there are um, a couple of individuals that are building a Swagger plugin for Hug, as well as, um, I forget what it's called, but there's a HTTP spec for automatically building with it, since it provides all that information for you. Anyone else? Why can I use this instead of DRS? What is it? Oh, Django REST framework? Um, because Django REST framework is really focused on how you can expose database models as an API, which is perfect if all you're ever trying to do is expose database models as an API. But if you're trying to do something like create a build service, that doesn't help you at all and really hinders you because now you're trying to create your continuous integration thing and put it into a model when it doesn't belong there. Any sort of calculation. So like if you're building an AI system um, and you're doing calculations to figure out what the user said on the server, it wouldn't really be logical to create a database model for that just so that you could provide an API. And that's really what Hug is trying to solve. I think that's it. Thank you, Jim. Next up, I have a quick announcement. Uh, we have uh, one of our members, Brett. Come on up here, buddy. He is running a geoengineers meetup, and he's looking to get more people. Is, is anyone here interested in geo? Luke, you do some geo stuff, right? Sai, you do, yeah? yeah so your next? Oh, Sai, all right, great. Who's a Sai's a member, and then uh, some other. Some other Tell us a little bit about your meetup. Some other of our dear brother, my brothers. So uh, yeah, I'd like to inter introduce. I'd like to introduce you to uh, geoscience, geoengineering. I would also, because you guys are much bigger than we are, maybe you could join our meetup and maybe give us a ride or something. <laughs> What's your first meetup about? The first meetup is about earthquakes, and uh, we're journeying possibly down the Hood River, and they have several uh, UW, a couple of UW professors, a couple of guys from the University of Oregon, and uh, it's going to be. Uh, it's going to be really good if you, if you have any interest in geology. If you don't, come to me and I'll try to spawn some. Maybe you could help me map out the uh, temperatures, the subterranean temperatures, the in situ temperatures of, of the planet because there's a lot of very interesting work going on these days. And Python's, Python's the game, you know? Uh, <laughs> NumPy and SciPy, and we'll, we'll, we'll get you all pied. <laughs> what day? Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, anyway, the, uh, I don't have the meetup. Sorry. All right. So it's geoengineering. <laughs> geoengineering. Uh, my name's Brett. I'm in this meetup, and uh, it's uh, I'm, I'm a I'm a co, and uh, the we have a meetup uh, a meetup scheduled for early October. I think it's the second of October. <coughs> and I'd love to have you guys. You know, come help us. We're we're just starting. We only got like 20 people, 30 people, something. And uh, we'd love to have a whole bunch of people, and, and we will consider you guys sisters. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank you, Brett. All right, now we're going to have a quick 15 minute break. So get up out of your chair, stretch a little bit. This talk has about a five minute musical intro. Uh, what I want you to do is listen to the music, listen and to the structure of the music. This is a Baroque work written 400 years ago. And then read my pithy slides as they go by. <laughs> All right. Uh, this talk has a lot of moving parts. Uh, things inevitably go wrong. And by the way, I'm not a musician. OK. So we start there. there. <laughs> Thank you. 
This is not an oboe. <laughs> and while I call it a concerto in G, and the music you saw going by was in the key of G, Vivaldi actually wrote it in the key of F. And those of you who might have perfect pitch, that was actually the music you heard was in the key of C. But, you know, it worked. When he wrote it, he did not have in mind an electric version of the bassoon uh, accompanied by an Indian sitar, Turkish zither, and Jamaican steel drums. <laughs> Likely the thought never even crossed his mind. But it worked. I did not fall over and have some sort of seizure when trying to play this music. None of you in the audience burst into flames. It all just worked, even though it had nothing to do with, the instrumentation had nothing to do with what Vivaldi's original concept had been. So what is it about 400-year-old music that makes it still work? Yet, as I said in that earlier slide, I can't open a Word document from 1999 or 1990. So we're going to explore today some of the parallels between music and software and maybe come up with some ideas on how music is so tenacious and can survive for centuries. Yet the software that we write will have a lifetime of months, years, not generally much longer than that. So hi, my name is Lars. I work for the Mozilla Corporation. I call myself the web engineering herd patriarch. <laughs> Now, actually, our group name has changed a couple times since I made that slide. I think we're called Web Tools Bath and Beyond or something like that. <laughs> um, I'm not sure exactly what our name of our own group is, and I don't really care. I just program. I, I just do ice. I just program. <laughs> so if you hadn't figured it out by now, I'm somewhat of an eccentric. Not only can I be seen in public occasionally wearing antlers. By the way, those are 3D printed. Uh, <laughs> wearing antlers, uh, but I am over 50 years old and I am still working as a programmer for a Silicon Valley corporation. I kind of think that probably gives me endangered species status, <laughs> uh, but I haven't actually made formal application for that yet. I may, may take an act of Congress or something like that. <laughs> now, this is the 40th 4-0 40th anniversary of my career as a professional poker programmer. I have been doing this a long time, and I have seen a lot of things over the years. And it has made me into a skeptic. Because I honestly believe that uh, software engineering, programming, is as beholden to the whims of fashion as the apparel industry is. There are things that we did back in the 1980s that fell out of favor. And what do you know, here in the 20 teens, we're rediscovering these wonderful new things, and all of you young folks think, look what we've just invented. But we rejected them in the 80s for good reasons, and so I'm a skeptic. And when I speak out against these things, then we see I am actually a heretic, too. <laughs> so those of you who know me, which probably not many people in this group actually know me, know never talk to Lars about PEP-8. <laughs> I think it's a mess. What is, what makes code clearer for some people, obfuscates it for others. And of course, I'm one of the ones that obfuscates it. But I'm not here to talk about PEP-8. I'm here to talk about much more interesting things. Now, I said this is the 40th anniversary of my career. Last year, last summer, I did a motorcycle tour and went around to companies that I worked for 10, 20, and 30 years ago. I wanted to find out what became of the software that I wrote so long ago. And some things surprised me. First surprise. I was only escorted off the campus of a company once <laughs> by security. Um, two, I have code that I wrote in 1985 in Fortran 77, the language Fortran 77, that is still in use today. Driving flatbed plotters. And if any of you in this audience have school-aged children, 
Likely, this software is drawing maps for school districts to do optimal school bus routing. I worked for this company back in Missoula, Montana that owns probably 90% of the worldwide market of optimal school bus routing. <laughs> so what was it about that software that has made it last for so long? The answer is abstractions. I abstracted the concept of a flatbed plotter so that when a new model came out or something else that would accomplish the same task as a flatbed plotter, all they had to do was write a little module in Fortran or C and just plug it in and it would use the new, new device without having to do any other, any other modifications. We encapsulated the change into a small section of the code. Fast forward uh, 10 years from there, uh, the 1990s. In 1994, I was working for a company in Corvallis, Oregon called Rogue Wave Software. Yeah. They wrote uh, um, C++ class libraries and sold them. My opus for that group was DB Tools. Essentially, think SQL Alchemy for C++ 10 years before SQL Alchemy was even conceived encapsulated the SQL language and all sorts of different commercial relational databases from Sybase to Oracle to M, uh, IBM DB2 and the list goes on. Again, why is that software still in use? Because of the abstractions. All they have to do to support a new database is write a small module. So the interesting thing about this is if I look at the software that I wrote that hard-coded things, well, actually, I can't look at that software because it's gone. <laughs> Nobody remembers it even. It's totally gone. Software that I wrote that has abstractions lives on. So we're going to talk about that in terms of music. First, music lives on in ways that are generally our software does not. So let's get started. I've broken my talk here into movements, like a piece of music. And when you speak to a musician and tell them how fast something is to go, you speak to them in Italian. And so, movement number two, vivace. Vivace means very fast. This is going to go by extremely quickly. In fact, so quickly, this could actually be the last slide of my presentation. Because this is the message that I want everyone to take to heart. An API should be independent of its implementation. Now think about that and think of the code that you've written in the last two weeks while I offer you a musical metaphor. <laughs> Now my metaphor isn't going to make any sense at all until I become redundant. So an API should be independent <laughs> of its implementation. Please think about this and the code that you've written, written recently while I offer you a musical metaphor. <laughs> If I haven't made my point yet, it's going to get clearer and clearer. <laughs> but before we can really get into this, we need to move on. Um, and movement three, allegro non troppo. Allegro meaning quickly, non troppo meaning but not too quickly. Now that's ambiguous. But there's a whole bunch of stuff in music that is ambiguous. And that gives it some flexibility. In software engineering, we hate ambiguity. But actually, if you look at the world, and as programmers, we're modeling things that are in the real world. Ambiguity is part of the real world. And if we ignore it, then we're perhaps doomed to make, doomed to make some brittle, more brittle software than we need to. But we need to do a little remedial music theory for programmers. I need to teach you guys a little bit of music so I can show you how uh, some of the abstractions used in music we use in software engineering too. 
So most of the music that you've heard in your life is based on a 12-tone chromatic scale. Now, not all music is done like this. There's Eastern music and Western music. But if you just turn on the radio right here in Seattle right now, you're going to hear something that's based on a 12-tone chromatic scale. It goes like this, unless I screw it up. I'm sorry, I screwed it up. <laughs> Play a major scale instead of chromatic. Ooh, kick him up! <laughs> Get a big hook. Drag <laughs> Now, you notice you remembered the note I started on, and it didn't sound complete until I played that last note. In fact, you were all just going, mm, mm, play the last one, play the last one. So that last note and the first note that I played are the same note. They're just an octave apart, a doubling of frequency. This whole 12-tone chromatic scale is repeated throughout our entire range of hearing. All of these notes repeat. Every one of them is a doubling. We divide this, this frequency range into 12 discrete steps. And if you think of the mathematics of that, there's something rather suspicious there. Powers of 2 divided by 12? Now, in different forms of music throughout history, people have discovered and rediscovered this 12-tone scale. For some reason, we as humans recognize this 12 tone and it repeats in, in music from India, music, other, other derivations of music. So let's do some definitions. The unit of pitch in music is called the step. Of course it's not a metric unit, it's pretty crazy. And we define it by saying what half of one of these things is, a half step. A half step is the change in pitch between any two contiguous notes on this chromatic scale. Uh, there's a half step between 3 and 4. There's a half step between 7 and 8. Consequently, if we look at every other note, we get a whole step. There's a whole step between 4 and 6, and a whole step between 9 and 11. A step is a strange thing, though, because it's not linear. It isn't just we add the same number of frequencies as we go up, because these frequencies double across that range of 12. So it's not linear. Now we can make different patterns on the chromatic scale to make different kinds of scales. This particular odd pattern has a name. It's one of the most important scales in, the, in Western music. It's called the major scale. And it sounds like this. A little screwed up there, but close enough. Now this looks like a piano keyboard. That's because the piano keyboard is based on the C major scale. Uh, I, I can't explain how, why, why these notes are named the, exactly where they are, why we started C instead of A, but there's somebody knows. We'll leave it at that. So if we go back and look at the chromatic scale, those black notes they're really second-class citizens here in the, in the scale. They don't get names of their own. They only get names that are relative to the notes they sit next to. And in fact, this one here, this leftmost black note, if you look at it th from the perspective of the C to the left, we consider it to be C sharp. That's C with a little hash sign. Sharp means up one half step. If you look at it from the perspective of, of the D next to it, it's a D flat, the little B lowercase b means one half step lower. So C sharp and D flat are actually the same note, same pitch. But that wasn't this true through history. That's a modern invention. And I'll explain more about that in a little bit. How many of you people here remember, oh, maybe sometime in the aughts, uh, the DCSS, the uh, encryption code for DVDs? This is kind of the same idea. This is the code for a major scale. We're lucky nobody tried to patent this recently. But this is a set of deltas in steps for which you can make a major scale. We can start on any note, uh, any note whatsoever in the chromatic scale and make a major scale out of it. Let's try it. Here's the note of D. We go up one step to an E, one step to an F sharp, half step to G, 
one to A, one to B, one to C sharp, and finally one half step back to D. You know, one of the strange things about this instrument, with a piano, when you hit a note, it speaks. With this, it's divided. I can hit a note and make it speak separately. <laughs> it's, it doesn't work very well for moon piano noises. So anyway, the D major scale. I can start on any, major, any note I want and make a scale out of it. Here's F. G. Now, how many people here are musicians? You'll, I, I apologize. How about minor third, flat fifth, pentatonic? So, uh, one of the things that I did early on in this presentation, I was going to have someone call out, make a scale out of this note. And someone like him would say E flat, or some major, some major scale which is difficult to play and I wouldn't be able to do it. So this is my way of silencing them, by not letting them have the chance. <laughs> so, um, the tuning. Now, the ch actual change in frequency between the notes is called the temperament, or the tuning of a scale. And we use a system today called equal temperament. It allows me to do this mir miraculous thing. That's the beginning of Bach's fugue in G minor. Except, I started on the note of A, so it's actually, I played it in A minor. I could do the same thing that I do with a scale. Any piece of music can be reduced to a series of deltas in pitch, and you can start on any note you want. If you follow the same set of deltas, you'll get the same piece of music out. Here it is in F. that same thing too. It just will be lower or higher in pitch. 500 years ago though, instruments and instrument families were not tuned the same way. They had their own temperaments and that had some dire effects on music. That meant that music playable on one instrument was not necessarily playable on another instrument in the same key that it was originally written. I'm going to prove that to you by changing my instrument here to have the tuning if I can get the right menu here, I was supposed to have set this up ahead of time but I think every single time I've done this I've forgotten to do that tuning there Click. I have just changed my instrument to be tuning from the 1300s medieval tuning sounded kind of weird. I mean, it wasn't horribly weird, but and if you heard the entire piece played that way, perhaps by the end of the piece it wouldn't sound so weird anymore. But I played that again starting on A in A minor. Now, let's do that same trick that I did before and start on F instead. But before I do this, uh, I made arrangements with uh, Rover.com here. Uh, in front of you, there should be a seat pocket and an air sickness bag. <laughs> Please locate it now. You may need it. I did not change the tuning of my instrument one bit. All I did was start on a different note. In the original tunings from that era, you could not change keys in the same way that we do now. Why? Because C sharp and D flat back then were two different notes. Only in our modern tuning have they changed and unified into two notes. So how does our modern equal temperament actually work? Well, let's give you an example. Turn this back to equal temperament. 
bring up the equalizer, which of course appeared on the wrong screen. This is a, a frequency analyzer. I'm, my instrument is now just playing sine waves using equal temperament. Yeah, you get the idea. And, uh, I'm going to play for you the C major chord. Now, getting my instrument to play chords is a challenge. Do you hear a wobble in that? Wah, 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 wah. You can actually see it there on the screen. That's out of tune. But I assure you, according to equal temperament, this is perfectly in tune. Let's go back to medieval. sick. <laughs> so how does modern equal temperament actually work? By cheating. Basically <laughs> what we have done is taken every single note in the chromatic scale and made it slightly out of tune. Just enough, just a little bit, so that we can change uh, keys with impunity. We've taken this perfect and sacrificed it for the good enough. And all of you people, I don't know how many, what the percentage of our population, that have perfect pitch, we've just thrown you under the bus. <laughs> we don't care about you anymore. So we have taken uh, every note, made it slightly out of tune, merged C sharp and D flat into one note, and allowed us to change keys with impunity. And the effect on music was, this is one of those places where there are way too many moving parts. Oh my, I wasn't supposed to do that. I didn't stop my music earlier. <laughs> All right, technical failure, please stand by. Here we go. The effect on the musical world was... Did you notice those red notes as they were going? Stop. <laughs> those red notes as they were going by? Every one of those red notes is not in the key that this piece was written in. When John Williams wrote this piece, he wrote it in the key of E flat. But every one of those notes is not, I'm sorry, the key of E, uh, every one of those notes that's in red is not in that key. And every time one of those red notes played, you had an emotional reaction. You couldn't help it. Because when you change keys in a piece of music, Something happens in the human brain, and you get an emotional response. So we were able to, by changing keys, we opened up a whole new emotional aspect of music. People think of Baroque music, and you think of it as rather dispassionate. Well, maybe not dispassionate, but lacking some, it seems mechanical. Even if we look at the, the eras of music, after we started doing equal temperament, or different, different types of temperament that allowed us to change keys, even the names of the eras of music changed. We went from Baroque, which is complicated and mechanical, into the area, era of classical and romantic music. So, whoops. Uh, reason number one, why 400-year-old music still works today. Compromising on tuning standards decouples the scales from the instruments that played them. We no longer have instruments that are, well, we have them, but we no longer have to use instruments that are dedicated to certain scales. And that, it gives us hardware compatibility. <laughs> People who manufacture instruments have a standard to go through, go by, and all of their instruments can play all of the music. People from different parts of the world can get together and play music because they their scales match, their tuning matches. That's why I can play Vivaldi work 400 years later with an Indian sitar and Jamaican steel drums. 
It also involved, gave us the Universal Musicians API, the piano keyboard. In the piano keyboard, you have 88 keys of the chromatic scale. If C sharp and D flat were not the same note, and every scale had to have its own key, we would have 11 ranks of keys on the keyboard, and it would be almost impossible to play, and not as well as manufacture. All right, let's move on and step away from music for a few minutes and talk about software. Movement five, adagio con bravura. Adagio meaning slowly, con bravura meaning with skill. Now every talk that I have given in the last eight years, uh, sorry, remember that. <laughs> every talk I've given in the last eight years eventually wanders in some way to Firefox crash reporting. <laughs> that's because that's what I have done for the Mozilla Corporation. I wrote their crash reporting system. Uh, throughout the world, I mean, there, there's half a billion users of Firefox out there. It crashes quite a bit. Not as much as it used to, but crashes quite a bit. We get between three and five million crashes per day. And so this system allows us to analyze those crashes and try and figure out what went wrong. The system is called Socorro. It's an open source piece of software written entirely in Python, handling all of that, all of those crashes. And by the way, it uses WebPy. <laughs> so anyway, this is basically what it looks like. I'm gonna reload that just in case. Please reload. Why aren't you reloading? Well, we'll find out if it's actually going to do the right thing. So anyway. This is a block diagram of the Socorro system. And I'm going to show you exactly how a crash moves through this system. The Firefox logo in the middle left uh, represents a user of Firefox. And the lower one is someone looking at our crash reporting system. I'm going to make Firefox crash and show you the process of how it flows through the system. So crash. It sends this packet of data through our Apache uh, Nginx uh, mod whiskey saves this into a local file system. These processes called crash movers take that, bifurcate it, and save it into RabbitMQ and to Amazon S3. Then processors wake up, pull jobs out of the, the uh, RabbitQ, which tells them what to grab out of Amazon S3, and then they perform a miracle. They take the binary crash information, re marry it with simple information from our build system to make a snapshot of what Firefox actually looked like with uh, debug symbols in it. And then saves a copy back to Amazon S3, to Postgres, and to Elasticsearch. Now these boxes here, they're, they're all programs. They're all very important. But the interesting thing here are the arrows. Every one of those arrows represents an API call. And most of those API calls are the same API, or most of those arrows. They represent an API called crash storage. It is a hierarchy, a classic object-oriented hierarchy uh, of classes that implement our business logic API. Let's look at this a little bit more closely. Now, this isn't the complete API. This is just an excerpt of it, of the important bits. And of course, it's called crash storage base. And it has two major families of methods. The fetch methods, which allow us to fetch a raw crash, that's an unprocessed crash, the metadata. Fetch raw dump, this is the binary chunk that Firefox sends as it dies, tosses over the wall to our servers. And fetch the processed crash, that's that uh, information uh, that's been remarried with symbols. Uh, those are the fetch methods. There are also some save methods to save that same information and save the processed information. We have implemented these, this crash storage API, oh, I'm sorry, got ahead of myself. Um, these uh, methods, I didn't notice they're a NERIC application. I didn't realize we were missing stuff off the edge here. Uh, this is a framework called Fetch, Transform, and Save. All of those programs that we uh, uh, have running in, in the boxes in the diagram are based on this Fetch, Transform, and Save. The Fetch functions correspond to the fetch phase and the save functions to the save phase. The transform is also an API. I'm not going to talk about that one right now because it would otherwise get to be a, like a six hour talk. It's already long enough. 
We've implemented this crash storage API for these technologies, plus about four more since I've made this slide. What do you notice about this list of things? They're not the same. And in fact, they even have different agenda. Some of them are storage systems, some are queues, some are just protocols. How many people are familiar with HBase? HBase is a uh, data store, a NoSQL data store built on top of Hadoop, the MapReduce engine, the open source version of Google's Bigtable. RabbitMQ, it's a queuing system. File system, it's just a way of organizing stuff on a hard drive. Elasticsearch, another big parallel system for doing search and analytics, probably written in Java. <laughs> uh, and then there's uh, Postgres, a fine, upstanding transactional relational database, structured data, structured transactional queries. Amazon S3, the antithesis of structured data. Put anything into a bucket and grab it out by its ID. And HTTP is, HTTP is just a protocol. So how in the world can you make one API do all of these things? By embracing ambiguity. This is Socorro's chromatic scale. By making an API that allows for some dissonance, that is OK that we don't treat all of these things the same. Under the covers, um, when we, we have Postgres and we tell it to commit or roll back a transaction, you know, we're doing the same thing to HBase, which has no idea what commit and rollback mean. And so rather than raising an error at that point and throwing the program into chaos and halting, HBase in our API just shrugs and says, oh, yeah, I did that. <laughs> so with a tuning that allows for some dissonance, Socorro can treat all of these things as if they were the same and decouples all of these resources from Socorro. It is, in some ways, as somebody else's problem field. We have gone and given the system integrators the problem of deciding what is acceptable for failure and what is not. So it also gives us the opportunity to make some meta crash storage systems, things that aren't necessarily dedicated to any sort of actual storage system. This particular one that you see right here is called a multi-crash store, uh, and it has the same API, but it's just a Python collection. It is an ordered list of other crash storage systems. So we could put one of these things in. In fact, you saw one of these things uh, in the crash mover that saved to RabbitMQ and to Amazon S3, and in the processor, which saved to uh, Amazon S3, Postgres, and Elasticsearch. It has the same API. I'm only showing you the save process method here because I don't want to fill out the whole screen. It accepts a process crash and then iterates over its collection of other crash storage systems, passing the same process crash into each one. Now, there are all sorts of amazing things that you can do with this. Think of a crash storage system that has two crash storage parts to it. If the first one fails, it goes to the fallback system. Or a whole hierarchy of fallback systems. Or you can write filters using this kind of a system. So let's write a program. Let's write the crash mover program right now. So here we do, we import each of those items in, by the way, fine. Pep 8 style. <laughs> we import each one of those things. Now, there's a problem. With just this much code, we've got a problem. Back at the beginning of my talk, remember that I said everything that I wrote that hard coded anything is gone, forgotten, never to be seen again? What have we just done here? We hard coded three crash storage systems. So how in the world do you decouple your resources from the source code itself? Overloading. Overloading, but you still end up having to write them down in your source code. I don't want to write this down in my source code at all. I want that part to go away. Late binding. Late binding is exactly it. How many people have heard of dependency injection? Excellent. Dependency injection is runtime binding. Uh, it's generally considered, to, and most of the places I've ever heard of this being done, is in Java. Oh, sorry. Uh, 
Uh, but you know, Python does it really, really well. And it does it really cheaply. Yeah. Uh, you know, you think of uh, Java um, uh, dependency injection, and you immediately think of a like a six megabyte XML file, uh, <laughs> and it's it's you know it, it makes me run run away screaming. But Python gives you the import method. It is just like the import statement, except you can pass it a string, and it will import whatever you tell it to import, and return to you an object that is the same first class first class style of object that the import statement had given you. So in this particular case, I'm grabbing the first argument off the command line, and if the user had typed this in, I'm going to get that imported right then and there at runtime. So I don't have to make the decision in my source code of what classes we're going to load. So let's wrap that import method in uh, a little bit more complicated method to uh, tear these things apart and, and actually instantiate the object for us. Now that's quite a bit of code. Oh, looks terrible with it side cut off like that. Uh, that's a def statement, not an f statement. <laughs> uh, so it accepts a class as a string. That's that dotted path set. And then it takes those dotted, that dotted string and breaks it up into little pieces uh, on the dot. And then it loads the package and modules, imports them, and then searches through that hierarchy of thing packages that you just imported for the class, finds it, and then instantiating it, passing it a uh, configuration that you passed in from the original function up at the top. Now this is a really powerful uh, idea because it allows me to do this. We take our fetch transform save framework and let's say we're going to grab the first item off the command line and send it to dynamic load. The user types in this class, the file system class. We dynamically load it and boom, our fetch transform save has a file system as its top end, its input side. Then we can get one of these multi-crash doors for our save end, like that, and then get the second and third items from the command line, RabbitMQ and Amazon S3. We've dynamically loaded them, giving them the whole uh, constructor for the, uh, that says app equals, fetch transform save app, uh, passing in the uh, algorithm for uh, uh, the crash mover, and we have an app that's ready to run right then and there. Now back when I first started working with Socorro, uh, it was 2008, and Socorro had originally been written by some of our platform engineers, and it didn't work. Uh, we were using cast off old machines, and at that point in my career, I was working as an emergency services programmer. Uh, people would hire me to come into their business for two weeks and make the software work at any cost on a Thursday afternoon when it absolutely has to be working by Monday morning. And I got really good at emergency programming. It wasn't pretty, but I could make software work. Mozilla hired me because Socorro didn't work, and we were three weeks away from Firefox 3 being released. So I took this system, uh, our four Poor Postgres server was terribly overloaded. It had been cast off from some other machine, uh, other department. And so I bifurcated it and made it so it would save only a sampling of our data uh, and save, put the rest of it back into our file system. Now this implies that it's a very modular system at this point, and it wasn't very modular. There were a lot of hard-coded things. So that got us going for Firefox 3. But then the time 3.5 came out, uh, we needed to do something else because it just wasn't keeping up. We had a new metrics department at that point, and they were hot on this Java technology called Hadoop and HBase. <laughs> and so we created this system, and this is the point where I started realizing well, we need this, this crash storage API. And so I made our first rudimentary parts of it. And we built this, all, built this got it going, and it worked just fine in staging, so we went to production with it. <laughs> and Hadoop at that point was not very stable. It was difficult to maintain. Uh, and this was another example of perhaps 
uh, job security? This is an emergency. I have to use all of my skills to make this thing work by Monday. So what I did was I brought back our original form of our collectors, the things that grabs the information from the users, the crash information, and created this crash mover and processor. We're using Postgres. If you think about the data flowing from top to bottom here, we read off the file system and move them into HBase. Postgres here we're using as a queuing system. How many DBAs in here? One DBA in the back. What happens when you have a queuing table and a relational database? <laughs> DBAs get very sad. <laughs> but we limped along with a, a queuing table in Postgres for three years. Whoops. <laughs> I'm going to go too far. So uh, at this point, the crash storage API had matured. And we needed to get rid of Postgres as our queuing system, and we went to RabbitMQ. So what we did was in one week, wrote a crash storage API for RabbitMQ, plugged it in, and it just worked. Because all of the code for RabbitMQ was encapsulated into one module. Nothing about RabbitMQ's internal details leaked outside that module. Socorro knows nothing about RabbitMQ. All it knows, crash storage API. I'll just shove stuff there. So later in 13, we decided that we need a better way of searching our data. So we added Elasticsearch. Again, writing just a single module, adding it to a multi-crash store, and we had Elasticsearch uh, being filled with data. Then last year, in 2014, uh, we were given an edict from management that uh, we were going to close our own data center and wanted to move to Amazon, the Amazon cloud. So we followed the same formula again. We wrote the Amazon uh, uh, crash storage system. And you notice here that we've got HBase and Amazon S3 running in parallel. Inputs on top, outputs on the bottom. We're writing to Amazon S3, but we're never reading from it. What we did is we let it run this way for an entire month. And at the end of that month, we decided we would compare HBase and Amazon S3 to make sure they had identically the same data. Well, they did. Um, management assumed that we were going to take a year to make this transition. We verified, we wrote the Amazon S3 in about a week, uh, and then verified it for the first month. And then, at that point, we were happy with Amazon S3. And so all we had to do, because of runtime late binding, was change the configuration file for uh, the processor and send it the SIGHUP signal. Reload your configuration. You don't even have to shut the program down. And this happened. Watch the red Lego in the upper right. The programs didn't shut down. All they did is started getting their, their data from Amazon S3 instead. They couldn't tell. All they knew is they were reading Crash Storage API. So uh, after that point, and we let it run for another month, decided that, yep, HBase and Amazon S3 still have exactly two months of identical data. We rewrote the configuration file again, sent SIGHUP again, and HBase was gone. And we retired 70 machines that were running HBase. Again, not even restarting the programs. The one thing that I can say that is constant here is change. We needed flexibility, an ambiguous API that didn't care about the different agendas of these, of these different uh, systems enabled us to have the flexibility to take this system, five to six million crashes a day, 70 terabytes of uh, data at, the, at um, the back end, and we turned it on a dime. So. We're going to go back to music. There are many parallels in music uh, for in software engineering. We've seen tuning and how tuning, uh, I'm sorry, how I get distracted here trying to get these things work. Uh, we've seen tuning. There are other abstractions and other interesting things about music that are parallel to what we do in software engineering. Movement six on Dante, a good stately pace. In music notation, the score of a piece of music graphically reveals the threading model. 
What is the score of a piece of music? The score is all of the voices, all of the parts written out in one place at one time. The conductor of an orchestra has the score in front of them, while each of the individual musicians has only their part. The score is everything at once. And what in the world is the threading model of a piece of software, or uh, sorry, a piece of music? Let me give you an example. This is box fugue in G minor for pipe organ in its original form. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> organist, you know these things are in groups of three lines? The organist plays the top line with the right hand. They play the second line with the left hand. And the bottom line is played with the pedal notes on the floor. So what do I mean by threading model? Well, if you think about that, one organist, one, two, three threads. One processor and three threads. Because the organist can play different things on their feet and their right and left hands at the same time. Those are threads with only one processor. Now just like in software, if we want to change the threading model, we refactor. In music, it's called rearranging. We can make a quartet of this, four processors and one thread each, a quartet of flutes. Flutes inherently play one note at a time, so they're only one thread. We can take this further. Five trumpets, six clarinets, or go all out and make an entire chamber orchestra work of this piece. 21 processors with one thread each. 22 if you count the conductor. The, the one thing to note, though, about music, it's a little bit different with software. As you add processors to music, you don't get through it any faster. <laughs> <laughs> so Johann Sebastian Bach was a master of multi-process, multi-threaded music composition. You know this piece? Toccata and fugue in D minor. Got it. Toccata and fugue in D minor. There's a really great chord that happens right after that. But I'm only one thread. That's really so, hard. Yes. I actually could play it for you here, but it's, it's too complicated. It's, it's hard to make my thing that do chords reliably. So um, that toccata and fugue, I'm actually more interested in the fugue than I am the toccata. It has this theme in it. down there instead of up here. Um, so at the same time that that theme is going on, this theme's going on. Simple descent. If you analyze it, it's actually the same theme as the faster theme that I played, but it's been stretched out over time, slowed down, and truncated. The organist plays them both at the same time. Shouldn't be a problem. Two hands, two threads, two themes except the left hand is already busy playing harmony notes. And the pedal notes on the floor are too low in pitch. So the organist has only the right hand to play both themes at the same time. Bach makes it easier by taking the slow theme and breaking it up into little pieces. And then alternates interleaving the slow theme and the fast theme. Top note, I played A, we'll have to play A 22 times before it even goes on to its second note. Now the musical effect of this is really kind of wonderful. It makes it possible for the organist to play it, and it makes a nightmare for any woodwind musician who wants to try to play this. Well, 
that's a challenge, of course. <laughs> um, when I first started practicing this, I'm going to play it for you, it's, it's 96 notes in less than 19 seconds. And I have to move up to nine fingers at a time between notes. It's really a nightmare. <laughs> I screw it up frequently in front of people, which is embarrassing. So if I try and play this and I screw it up, you will suddenly hear this. Stuck key. Um, that means that I'm trying to attract a parade of clowns to come in, because <laughs> I don't want to be the only one standing up here. So I'm going to play this for you, but before I do so, I'm going to do a little dependency injection and not play it on the organ. I'm going to play it on a celeste, which is that instrument that the Harry Potter theme was on. Essentially, it sounds like a doorbell. And in fact, if in Bach's era they had doorbells, it probably would have sounded like this. that I inadvertently gave away. What did you just hear an um, audio interpretation of in software engineering, especially in Python these days? Think twisted library. Asynchronous programming? Asynchronous programming. Cooperative multitasking done within a single thread in a single process. Who knew that we didn't invent this in the 21st century? We, the Baroque composers, in fact, Way back in medieval times, they were doing this alternating notes to get two themes played at the same time. It's old technology. Everything that we do was invented by someone else many, many years ago. So reason number two why 400-year-old music still works today. The source code is available. <laughs> And it's readily refactorable. <laughs> How many rock groups in the 60s, 70s, and 80s based their music off classical music? That's Jethro Tull in 1974. Uh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought there. Uh, the music. We've seen we can change the pitch, the tuning, change the different notes. We can change the threading model. We can even change the rhythm. I just changed that. That was Bach's, uh, one of Bach's berets. It was not the original rhythm that Bach used, but it's still recognizable as the same piece of music. Movement seven, prestissimo. I'm running out of time. We've got to speed this up. Prestissimo means very fast. So abstracting threading models. Just like in music, we refactor to change the threading model. Uh, musicians, I suppose, if you have a bunch of musicians who are good at improvisation, you could change the threading model of a piece of music. But we as programmers can change the threading model of our software much more easily. We can abstract this. We can do better than music can. So consider these two questions, and they seem unrelated. In Python, how do you shut down a thread? Any Python multi-threaded programmers here? No. Exactly. You can't shut down a thread in Python. You can't kill it. There's no API to do so. It must cooperate. Some authority must tell it, you shut down now, and it has to cooperate and decide, OK, I will die now, and it will do it. Second question. In a cooperative multitasking environment, and I'm going to use the example of G-Event and Greenlets, how do you switch contexts? Any asynchronous programmers here? In G-Event, you yield. And you can do a yield by calling a sleep method. Now, so it, co it cooperates by yielding. Both of these questions that involve multiprocessing, multiprocessing, um, but for different ends, both use the term cooperate. 
Now that's a pretty ambiguous thing here, but we can make an API out of just the word cooperate. Let's say this is our cooperate method for threads. If threads should quit, check some authority, raise the keyboard interrupt exception. That'll blow through all of the exception handlers and kill the thread. For G event, sleep for zero seconds. Now let's see how we can apply this to that fetch transform save framework. So uh, this is a, bit, a little bit more generic. We're not talking about crashes at this point. We fetch something, and then we cooperate. We transform it, make it into a process thing of some sort, some transform thing. And then we cooperate. And then we save it. And then we cooperate. Pass all of these things into the function or constructor or whatever it happens to be for fetch, transform, and save. And we end up with a structure that looks like this. The fetch, transform, and save becomes a worker for some engine, in this case, that's multi-threaded. And just because we're using the same late binding system that we use for crash storage, we could read to the, the configuration and turn this into a multi-processing uh, application. Or cooperative multitasking. Now there's not a lot of call for changing the threading model in a, a, at runtime for, for an application. However, if you are trying to optimize throughput, this is an ideal method of doing this because you can mix and match and find out which gives you the best throughput and then use whichever method works best for you. Okay, let's engage a little hyperbole here as we get toward the end of this. Decouple all the things. Everything. Abstract everything. Because as you know in your heart, there is no problem that cannot be solved by adding another layer of indirection. <laughs> Now, that actually might be true. We live in a very complicated world. Uh, if you've ever read the book, The Fractal Geometry of Nature, you see that everything about reality is nothing but layers and layers of indirection. If we ignore that and always try to get rid of indirection and, and always code to the simplest possible way, we're going to simplify down to the point of being incorrect. Back in the early part of my career, Lisp is one of the languages I learned early. And Lisp is all about recursion and indirection. <clears throat> but you know something? Lisp fell out of favor because there are just too damn many parentheses. It's too complicated. It's not understandable. Every time you add another layer of indirection, you make your software more complicated. And you make it more difficult for future programmers to maintain it. And the way we hire programmers these days, they don't stay around very long. How long does the average Amazon programmer stay at Amazon? Two years. Two years. There's no institutional memory there. Uh, as I've given this talk in various parts of the country, different era areas in the country have different retention level for programmers. Back in Ohio, most of my audience had been with their companies for nearly 10 years. How many people here have been at their company longer than two? Not very many. Longer than three? This audience is very much like the Silicon Valley audience. Not many people have stuck around at their companies for very long. So I, in my career, have always felt that I want to raise this bar of Num layers of indirection, because it's given me the crash storage API, which is extraordinarily flexible. But I'll tell you, the day that I leave Mozilla, people are going to look at this and go, <laughs> <laughs> they're not going to understand it, and they will rewrite it, and it will be hard-coded, and it will last two years. Uh, or if there for some, some luck, somebody understands it, I, actually document my code or something like that, uh, uh, then the crash storage API has the possibility of living for a very long time. Movement eight, Allegro, we're going to do this pretty quickly. You've heard this uh, uh, piece several times, the Bach Fugue in G minor. Uh, I am going to play, the piece is, is small, it's only three minutes long. I'm going to play the whole thing for you arranged as a quartet. But I'm going to do something different for this. I've annotated the uh, source code. I've annotated the score. 
that, but I want that, and I want that. <laughs> so I'm going to play this as a quartet. I'm going to play the flute. I'm going to be accompanied by a banjo, a vibraphone, which is a type of xylophone, and a dobro, which is a bass banjo. I'm also going to do this without my headset on, so I can't hear the metronome, so I may not, it starts with like a 10 measure solo, and I've got to make sure it's timed exactly right for the other voices to come in. <coughs> Finally, reason number three why 400-year-old music still works today, and something I have not even mentioned yet in this talk. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Hamlet 9 Coda. Questions? Comments? Anyone want to express some indignation? <laughs> yes? Could you clarify how you mean your API is ambiguous? Ambiguous because the result of when you call the a API, which happens to say save, isn't necessarily saving anything. It may be queuing something. It may be saving something. It may be throwing it away. There's a null crash storage class. So the names don't necessarily correspond to what it's really doing. Yes? So my experience with you is that the syntax wasn't that off-putting, mm -hmm. but her mm -hmm. the standardization mm -hmm. was really a problem because like right in the core of the language, I was forced to use abstraction for using storage technology from the 80s that mm -hmm. didn't apply to me. Do mm -hmm. you think that this was more of an impact on, on the... I think that there are a list? number of reasons why LISP uh, had its failure. Well, if you call it a failure, I call it actually a great success because I learned a lot from, from LISP. But its failure as a technology that's widely adopted is because of lack of standardization. Uh, there are so many different yeah, it varieties. Was the first standardized object, object there, the language, so it was standardized. Well, but there's so many different variants of LISP. There's Scheme, and there, well, it just goes on and on. And they're not necessarily all compatible with each other. And for me, in the way I perceive things, uh, trying to show something like recursion in its depth in something that is two-dimensional and have to do pattern matching in my mind with just braces or uh, parentheses, too difficult to track. A lot of people have, you have to have a certain mindset to really understand LISP. Now, I love LISP, but I, have, I can say some bad things about it. There, uh, there have been three major epiphanies in my programming career. The first one was my first understanding of recursion using the language Pascal back in the 70s. The second one was recursive pattern matching in Lisp. When I understood recursive pattern matching, it's like the world went from black and white to color. It was an epiphany in my career. The third one was learning object-oriented programming in the language um, Smalltalk. So I, I may speak of Lisp with, I guess I, spoke, I speak with it more is with regret. I wish that it had become more standardized because I really love the language. I wish that it didn't have the, the, the legacy problems that it has. But, you know, we can't have everything perfect the way I want it. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> teal shirt guy. <laughs> ben Ryan. So, uh, two uh, okay. One, uh, what do you need? Closure. I like closure. I haven't learned it much yet. I've played around with it, but it's gonna it, it's in my future if I have one. <laughs> so it hasn't been the same method with previous questions. Okay. Um, it has side effects that are important for a client to know. Uh, retrying, potentially retrying, say, uh, transactions or mm -hmm. otherwise having an issue of state. Exactly. You know, one of the things I said, it's like a somebody else's problem field. As a programmer, I've created this and made it the problem of the system integrator to understand the people who, uh, I, I made it IT's problem. <laughs> 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 to put these things together, assemble the Legos in the right way so that it doesn't create something that's an infinite loop in configuration. Yes? Uh, I guess my question Lars, is, uh, so, I mean, I, I like Firefox. I have for a very long time, you know, particularly they came out with first debugging tools, they were mm -hmm. the best. But when you're talking about all this multi-threading, can't you, you know, for example, uh, now Chrome has a, of course, a reputation that when one page goes down, it doesn't take out the, mm -hmm. doesn't take out the port. Why is that still a problem with uh, Firefox? Um, we had an initiative uh, about four years ago to make a uh, process per thread, or per, per tab. Thread per, yeah. Yeah, a, a process per tab, rather than a thread per tab, which is what we basically have right now. I think it's finally gonna get released sometime in the next couple months, actually, because uh, we've had to, in Socorro, retool 
to accept uh, multiple types of crashes now from the different processes. We're getting it. We're which taking us a while to get there. Do you know which number? Not, not off the top of my head. I'd have to look it up. I think the definition has one process for the trade-up trial. Yes. So first part of the comment, um, this was an awesome talk. I don't think I've smiled from year to year. <laughs> Great, right. thank you. My entire life, or <laughs> wow. 85% of the whole talk. And forgive me for asking, but what is your deal with Pepe? Absolutely. Bring it on. Yeah. Um, and you don't have my, to answer, but you probably. No, I'm going to answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, back in the ni early 1980s, I worked for a company called Diversified Computing in East Glacier, Montana. Wrote school record software for Indian reservations. It was run by a man named Bill Sipes, who was the, uh, one of the original people on the APL language team. APL. And, oh and he God. had this <laughs> paper from IBM uh, from the early 70s that talked about code reviews and style standards. And they found that style standards made their code buggier. Because when people reviewed the code, they would find a style violation, low-hanging fruit, and say, oh, style violation, here's your code back, fix it, rather than actually understanding what the code did. They found that if the code is in a form that is unfamiliar to the person doing the review, they actually had to sit down and study the code in order to understand it. And that's when they started finding the bugs. Uh, if everything looks the same, you start to just kind of gloss over things. It looks the same. It looks the same. Now, you probably have found in your lives that people have different skill levels. People's minds work differently. In the last couple years, um, I have discovered that my mind works very differently from most people that I know. I have what is called a synesthesia. Uh, I see colors in code. Uh, this first came to light for me uh, in a LISP class, an artificial intelligence class in graduate school. Uh, the professor had this thing on the, at the time, overhead projector, handwritten. Um, and I was doodling on my desk or something like that, not paying attention. And all of a sudden, I saw a flash of blue on the, on the screen. But he was clearly writing in black ink. And I stopped the professor and said, wait a minute, there's a problem in your code. And uh, he said, no, I've been using the same code for 10 years. And the rest of the people, the rest of the students in the seminar class probably rolled their eyes and said, oh, there goes Lars again. <laughs> um, and I couldn't tell him what the problem was. And I wasn't going to say it was blue. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so I just kind of let it drop. And the professor moved on. About three minutes later, he stopped scrolled the, the projector back and looked at his code and then looked at me and smiled and said, I never noticed that. Nobody has ever noticed that in 10 years. For me, I can see problems in code by detecting there's some sort of bluish cast to it. For me, PEP8 makes the, all the code blue. <laughs> it blinds me. It literally blinds me to finding errors in code. Um, I can't explain how or why. I can't explain what this blue thing is or how it works. But I know it does work. Um, one of the things that uh, PEP8 does, and only, I mean, not the whole thing of PEP8, the, the, the um, length of lines, making you overload the meaning of white space. Uh, white space in Python is syntactically significant. It's beautiful to not have to use braces to show the structure of your code. But the moment you start having continuation lines, all of a sudden you've overloaded the meaning of white space. And it, for my mind and for me, it obfuscates the structure. The structure isn't obvious anymore because you have all these indentations that don't mean a sub module or something like that. It means this line was too long and I had to go to the next line. And so for my mind, it turns the whole thing blue because the structure doesn't look right. Um, 
So, I mean, my mind doesn't work the way your mind works, which doesn't work the way your mind works. Um, I have a talk that I'm going to be giving as a keynote into Pi, Tennessee next year, and I'm going to talk about diversity of mindset. And I'm going to, instead of using an analogy of music, I'm going to use the analogy of the nursery industry and the great rosebush crash of 2008. What? <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to see the talk. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm flying to Tennessee. Yeah. So um, I think that like in nature, in a forest, diversity leads to resilience. In software, we need different types of minds. Different. Everyone has different skills. I think in recursion very well and very easily. Not everyone does. So as we have more people with different types of minds looking at the code, they can see different types of problems, they can, we can make more robust software by embracing diversity rather than going to monoculture. Uh, if you look at the wheat fields of eastern Washington, they're all monoculture. One strain of wheat. Uh, some disease could come along and wipe out absolutely everything. In software, we don't have the exact analogy, but you know, uh, one type of mindset will doom your software to one type of problem. So I hope that answers your question. That piece is kind of rambling on. Just don't pay, don't pay attention to the old man standing up front. Personally, we have elephants. I'll accept that. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much for having me here. By the way, I'm two braids on Twitter. There you go. I was going to say that, but he's got it taken care of, of course. <laughs> it's a very relaxing Twitter with nice pictures of photos. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That was an amazing talk. Thank I you. think, I mean, for me, that, like, I already said it, guaranteed best talk of the year. I don't think you let me down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was fantastic. Uh, we are going to be going to um, the Whiskey Bar after, if you guys are up for a little bit of an after party. Whiskey Bar, that's where we headed. Um, Is that the Mod Whiskey Bar? No, just the Whiskey Bar. Sorry. Uh, so I'm going to be heading some people out there. Ben Riley, raise your hand. He's going to be going to the Whiskey Bar if you want to follow him. Uh, Mike Delaney, I'm pretty sure, is going to the Whiskey Bar. Whiskey Bar, breakdown, and transport too. Yes, I've got about a half hour worth of breakdown yeah. and reorganization. If anyone's willing to help this guy, please eat bon mi yeah. there's a bunch of banh mi left. If you guys want to take some home, feel free to take some home. If you just want to eat some before you leave, that's fine. Uh, we have too much banh mi. I'm not taking that all home. No way. Uh, offer up, thank you for the food. Rover, thank you for the space. And all of you in chairs and standing, thank you for showing up. I think this was a great meetup. Hopefully yeah. you all enjoyed it as well. It was my, my favorite one in a, in a long time. No offense to anyone else, just talk to the other ones. <laughs> but this is the one I've been super psyched for for a while. And, it, and thank you, Tim. Yeah. Tim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Whiskey bar. Let's do it.